Hello friends, it is good to see you and to be with you and to worship online. Would you join me in our first opening hymn and sing? I know you're in your living room or your family room or your kitchen, but nobody else can hear you. Make a joyful noise. Let's sing together, friends. Friends, join me in this call to worship. Because of the Lord's great love, his compassion never fails. They are new every morning, and great is his faithfulness. And so we forget the former things and do not dwell on the past. See, the Lord is doing a new thing. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ Jesus, the new creation has come. The old is gone, and the new is here. Amen. This is a reading from John 4, 1 through 26. Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although in fact it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sinchar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gives us the well and drank from it himself as did all his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Instead, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. 
Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we worshipped is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me. A time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans will worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks." God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know the Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Here ends the reading of God's word. Greetings, everyone. It is good to be with you for worship today. Yesterday, I took a walk on the prairie in the afternoon, and I quickly discovered that it was much hotter than I had anticipated. I noticed that the paths were clear of people. I took out my phone, and the weather app registered 95 degrees. I got a text saying that my son's soccer camp had been canceled due to the heat index and the humidity. Nevertheless, I was determined to keep going because I need to shed a few of these COVID-15 pounds or whatever it is. And so I kept going. It didn't take long, though, before my whole body was just dripping with sweat. My mouth was dry. I was feeling lethargic and actually starting to feel a little bit dizzy. My whole body was crying out for water. And when I finally was able to get home and take my uh, first gulp, of cool, refreshing water. I was reminded of that nothing tastes as good when you're that thirsty as water and that nothing quenches our thirst quite like water. We need water to survive. We can only live a few days without it. Water is vital. Well, that's also true spiritually. We need the living God's water, the water that God provides for us to have our inner thirst or inner beings, souls, thirst, satisfied, and to be able to live forever. And that's what the passage in John 4 that we heard read earlier indicates. Here we get to see how Jesus leads a woman, and by extension us, to that source of living water. Let's pray before we jump into the passage. Lord God, we do thank you for your word. Thank you that you're here with us wherever we are by your Holy Spirit. I pray that you would open our hearts, that you would instruct us, that would, you would infuse our hearts with faith, that you would draw us to yourself, and that you would shape our lives. We pray for this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Well, Jesus is on his way to Galilee through Samaria. And tired and exhausted and thirsty and weary as he is, he sits down at the well called Jacob's Well there in Samaria. He's resting. And when a woman shows up to draw water, Jesus strikes up a conversation with her. She's just going about her business as usual, having no idea who she's going to meet there. And yet, she ends up meeting Jesus. She's not seeking him, but as we'll see, he is definitely seeking her. He's taking the initiative in reaching out to her, which is just another example of what he said in chapter 3, that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And so Jesus is reaching out to her. So whether we are consciously seeking God or not, 
we can know that the process begins with him. He isn't sitting there passively in heaven waiting for us to reach out and, and make the first move. No, he is already there drawing us. And this is an indication of that, that God is on the move. In fact, he is so eager to reach us that he became one of us. He clothed himself in human flesh so that we could come to know him. And when God began attracting my attention in the teens, I certainly was not seeking him, at least not consciously. My passion in life was to play drums in a rock band, to live life to the full, have a good time. And I felt like everything that had to do with God and church and faith and religion just stood in the way. But God continued to pursue me and in time that awakened my response. But it begins with him. He is taking the initiative and reaching out to us. And out of love, we see here that Jesus crosses a multitude of barriers and boundaries to reach this woman at the well. She wonders in shock and amazement, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. And so Jesus is crossing a social boundary here. Men didn't normally talk with women in public, especially not women that they were not related to or that they were not married to, and especially not a rabbi with a possibly immoral woman. So he crosses that boundary. And the fact that she comes there during the hottest part of the day at noon when Jesus is sitting there taking his break is an indication that she is ostracized, that she has a bad reputation perhaps, and therefore she's excluded from the other groups of women who would come to draw water normally in the morning or in the evening when it was much cooler. And so this is an indication that she's got a reputation that has caused her to be excluded and ostracized. And yet Jesus crosses this boundary in order to reach her. And so Jesus also crosses an ethnic boundary here. There's a deep animosity between the Jews and the Samaritans. The Samaritans were descendants of the Israelites in the northern kingdom of Israel who were conquered by the Assyrians in the 6th or 7th century before Christ. And most of them were carted away in captivity to Assyria. But the ones who remained ended up intermarrying with the newly immigrated Assyrians and other pagans that started to, to fill the land. And so they were viewed as ethnically compromised. And there was an animosity between them because of this. And they are also viewed as traitors because they cooperated with the enemy when the Israelites were conquered. And so that's what, that was fanning the flame of, of uh, hatred between the groups. And we see here that not only is Jesus crossing a social and ethnic boundary, but he's also crossing a religious one. The Samaritans were viewed as followers of a cult. They only accepted five of the books of the Hebrew scriptures, the first five books of Moses, not the writings and the prophets. And they had their own uh, temple site worship at Mount Gerizim there nearby. But the Jews accepted all of the books of the Bible uh, that, that has become known for us as the Old Testament. So both the books of no Moses, the law, and the prophets, and the writings as inspired by God. And they were convinced that the legitimate place of worship was a temple in Jerusalem on Mount Zion. And the pagans' faith, I mean, the, the Samaritans' faith had been colored with pagan elements. And so they were viewed as unfaithful uh, heretics, really. And given this background, no wonder the woman is shocked when Jesus reaches out and asks her for water. It's probably, it's probably been a long time since she's met that kind of respect from anyone, let alone a Jew. So Jesus has definitely caught her attention. Let's not underestimate the significance of this encounter. This is huge. This powerfully demonstrates the heart of God for all people. That he does not play favorites. He does not show favoritism. He treats everyone with equal dignity and respect. And when that understanding fills our hearts, that cuts the root 
of racism, and it inspires work for racial justice and equity and reconciliation. So let's catch more of that heart that leads Jesus to cross these boundaries, to reach out to a Samaritan woman who was hated and an outcast. We might not have Samaritans in our midst, but who are the Samaritans uh, metaphorically in your part of the world? Uh, how can you partner with God to reach out to them with the love of Jesus? How can we do that? Yeah, God calls us to be open to reaching out to anyone, anytime with the love of Jesus. But maybe he is putting a certain individual or family or part of your community on your heart to reach out to. Maybe to send a text or pick up the phone and make a call or to go knock on the door, invite somebody over for a socially or a physically distant coffee, whatever it might be to get the ball rolling. Who are your Samaritans and your world that you can reach out to? It's a question for us to, to take with us from this passage. Well, the next portion, the next move here is that Jesus begins to awaken a longing in the woman in verses 10 through 15. Jesus answers the woman's question with an enigmatic assertion that arouses her curiosity and further deepens the conversation. He says this, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. I love it how Jesus really encapsulates the whole gospel in one sentence. God is the giver of this gift. He gives it as a gift of grace. It's nothing that can be earned. Jesus is the mediator. It's in and through him that we receive this gift. This gift is received as we ask for it by faith. It's, a, it's just given as we open up our hearts and receive it in faith. And the gift itself is the gift of the Holy Spirit, the personal presence and power of God who cleanses us, who reconciles us to God, who gives us new and eternal life and begins to satisfy our soul thirst. And so I love it how Jesus uh, pu pulls all that together in that one cryptic statement for this woman. And as he does so, he's connecting to a rich Old Testament background where God himself is referred to as a fountain of living water, the spring of living water. And the psalmist says that he is thirsting for the living God. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul thirsts for the living God, the psalmist says in Psalm 42. And so Jesus is connecting to all of this and what he is saying. And that in and of itself is, is a quite a strong claim, which becomes more clear as you keep reading the gospel. But Jesus doesn't overwhelm her with information about everything all at once. He gives it in doses, little by little. Now Jesus, of course, engages in monologue as well when he's teaching to larger crowds and preaching to them. But here he's engaging in dialogue, a back and forth conversation. There's a, there's a give and a take here. And I'm just amazed at how tactful and socially competent Jesus is. He's able to relate to anyone from any walk of life. In the previous chapter we saw, he uh, reached out to Nicodemus, that educated ruler uh, who's part of the, the, the ruling council in Jerusalem. Uh, he is educated, he's learned, he's respected, he's a male teacher. And here we have really the exact opposite, an uneducated, anonymous, disrespected, possibly rejected woman. And he's able to relate to them both and meet them where they're at. God loves the whole world, yes, but not as one big sort of blob, one big mass. But he loves us as individuals. And he meets us as individuals where we are. And he tailors his approach accordingly. God has as many ways to reach people as there are people, I'm sure. But some are particularly awakened by community. The fellowship of the church has been described as the hermeneutic of the gospel that interprets what the good news of Jesus is and leads to. 
And this is something that was huge for me. I saw that Christians had something that I didn't, and that was very attractive, and that started opening my heart to seeking what they had. Others are especially drawn by acts of service. This was huge in the Roman Empire as Christianity started growing and spreading. The acts of service and compassion shown to people that were really outcasts or discounted or ignored by society. Christians cared and spent time investing and caring for them. And uh, that made a huge impact, a huge impression. It still does today. Others are especially impacted by the supernatural as the woman at the well is here. When Jesus reads her journal, reads her mail, really knows what's going on in her life without her having said anything, I've seen that happen today as well. And speaking of the supernatural, when I was in Ethiopia a few years ago, I had a chance to meet some people from Mekana the now the, wor uh, the world's largest Lutheran church body and the fastest growing one. And I got to ask how they do ministry, how they reach out to people. And one of the things that they do uh, in many different churches is to have a healing service where they meet on a Wednesday morning, they have some worship, they have a brief teaching, and then they invite people forward for prayer. Whatever's on their hearts, whatever's going on in their lives. And many people have been met by the power of God and they've been supernaturally healed and set free from evil spirits that are controlling their lives. And this has led many, many people to being open to faith in Christ. And I think about the Middle East, how people are getting dreams about Jesus. Millions of people apparently are getting dreams about Jesus that lead them on to, to begin to seek him and to pursue what that might be all about. And so God uses that to awaken people. For others, reason plays a vital role in awakening interest and desire and uh, leading on to faith. C.S. Lewis is one of those authors that uh, has meant a lot to me and he is a professor in England and uh, he died in 63 and he's written the Narnia Chronicles and a bunch of other books and he basically read himself to faith. He read and he followed the evidence to the logical conclusion and he became convinced that Christianity is true. And that's what opened his heart to Christ. And he says this, that God even uses pain to awaken us. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. When our family moved to the U.S. from Sweden when I was a teenager, it crushed me. But God used that to really get my attention and to get to draw me back to himself. And in her encounter with Jesus, the Samaritan woman is initially cautious. She's skeptical, even a little sarcastic. But the more they talk, the thirstier she becomes. She wants in on the living water that Jesus has described. And so she says, sir, give me this water. So Jesus has definitely awakened her longing and desire. Well, in the third move in verses 16 through 18, the conversation now takes a new turn. Jesus seems to suddenly change the subject when he asks the woman to go get her husband. It seems like that, what does that have to do with anything? Well, I think Jesus is letting his light shine into her heart. He's gently revealing that he's aware of her issues with men, that she's had five, five husbands and that the one that she now has is her live-in boyfriend. And so he's putting his finger on the area of her life that is causing a sense of shame. He's exposing her sense of guilt. And he's doing that not to push her down, to make her feel bad, but to set her free and to help her to deal with the big barrier that's in the way of her coming to God, that's keeping God at bay. Much like he does with the rich young ruler that comes to him and kneels before him and says, what do I have to do to gain eternal life? It says that Jesus looked at him with love and he said, go sell all you have, give it to the poor, and then come and follow me. And it says that the 
man went away sad because he had great wealth. His face fell. He was so disappointed because he would have to let go of the very thing that had become his God. His riches had, uh, riches had taken the place of God in his life. So his wealth was his functional God. It was his idol. It's not that way for all of us who are rich, but it was for him. Now, really, an idol is anything or anyone that takes God's place in our hearts. It could be money for this man. It could be romance, success, pleasure, entertainment, whatever it might be. These things promise a lot, but they don't deliver. They can't deliver. They don't give us what we really need. The Olympic swimmer Michael Phelps is one of the most accomplished athletes of all time, having won more Olympic gold medals than anyone in history. Yet after the 2012 Olympic, uh, Olympics in London, Phelps admitted to struggling with despair. He turned to alcohol and drugs. He even contemplated suicide. He experienced the emptiness of success without God. Well, in rehab, through the witness of a friend who gave him Rick Warren's book, The Purpose Driven Life, Phelps uh, came to believe that there is a power greater than himself and a purpose for him on this planet. And this became, uh, his life took a new turn as he made this discovery. Thankfully, Jesus doesn't reveal everything that's wrong in our lives at once. I wouldn't be able to handle that. I don't think any of us could handle that. But he does show us what we need to let go of in order to even begin the process of coming back to him. And that's what repentance is all about. It's turning around, turning back to him. There really isn't any other way. Uh, it can be uncomfortable when he shines his light within us. The brightness causes us to wince. Kind of like when I wake up in the morning and I open the blinds or turn on the lights, you know, it's just, it, it's jarring. It takes a minute to get used to it. But it is part of getting ready for the day. And it's part of um, getting up and, and, uh, and moving on. And so it is on the road to faith. So I think the message to us is let's let God shine his light on our lives, even if it's uncomfortable. He is telling us to open up our hands and receive the grace that he is giving to us. So if he's putting his finger on something that's standing in the way, dare to let it go and to open up and to come to him. It's like he's throwing us a ball of grace. If our hands are full of a bunch of other things, we won't be able to receive that ball. And so he's inviting us to let that go, to receive his grace. And when Jesus sees through the Samaritan woman, she realizes that he knows what he's talking about, that she needs what he is offering. And this deepens the conversation further and takes us to the, to the fourth move here. At first glance, it may seem like this conversation is hitting too close to home, and so she changes the subject, that like she's trying to avoid the subject because it's too painful, or um, that she's trying to distract somehow. So she asks this question about where to worship God. It's kind of like, you know, who's going to win the World Series? Or is she asking a question like, can God make a rock so big that he can't move it? No, I don't think that this is a smokescreen. I don't think she's trying to evade. I think that she's actually asking an honest question because she's realized her need. And she wants to know where to turn for redemption. And so this is a relevant question. And since Jesus obviously has prophetic insight, he seems to be the right person to ask. And then Jesus not only answers her question about where to worship, but also whom to worship and how. And so for the question of where to worship, he says this, that a new time is coming where the place of worship will no longer matter. The era of the temple is coming to a close. In fact, Jesus says in chapter 2 that he is the new temple by implication. So he is the ultimate sacrifice that fulfills the whole temple system. He is the high priest of a new covenant, a new agreement with God, a new way of being related to God. So it's now through him that we're connected to God. 
wherever we might be. And he goes on to talk about whom to worship. And here Jesus sides with the Jews. God has revealed himself in his fullness to the Jews. And it's the Jews that penned the scriptures. It's through the Jews that these promises get their fulfillment, where the plan of salvation unfolds and where it culminates in the Jewish Messiah. So it is in Jesus, the Jew, that all of these promises are fulfilled. And so in that sense, Jesus is saying salvation is from the Jews. And then he talks about how to worship. And he says that the Father is seeking worshipers to worship him in spirit and in truth. Yes, with sincerity, but by the power of the Holy Spirit, by his inspiration. The Holy Spirit is the one who helps us to engage with God, to know God, uh, and, and to worship him in the way that is pleasing to him. And then in truth, according to how God has revealed himself, which of course is especially evident in Jesus. And so the key is not where we worship, but whom we worship and how. And that's really good news during these, this time of quarantine. We were not able to meet here at 1310 Shepherd Drive yet. The time is coming, and I certainly look forward to that. But the good news is that we can worship God in spirit and in truth wherever we might be, right here and now, because Jesus has opened that pathway up for all of us, for all people. Then the woman replies that she knows that when the Messiah comes, he will explain everything. We can almost sense the hopefulness in her voice. Is he the one? Is this the one I've been waiting for? That he's, she now has contact with. And then Jesus comes right out and says it straightforwardly. I who speak to you am he. And this is where he wanted to take the woman. This is where he wants to take all of us. He wants to lead each and every one of us to himself, not to a system of belief, not to a denomination, not to a political ideology, not to a religion, but to a person, to Jesus himself. That's where he wants all of us to, to, uh, to come. He's inviting us all to come to him. So the question might be then, how do we open ourselves up to, to meeting him? How can we position ourselves for that type of faith to grow? Well, I believe a few tips would be spend time with those who claim to follow Jesus. See how their faith impacts their lives. See what difference it makes and see if God doesn't speak to you through that. Why not pick up the Bible and read it if you haven't done that before? Read through the Gospel of John and the other Gospels and the rest of it because I believe that that is a book that God inspired and he speaks to us as we read it. Why not get answers to those questions that you have? I've had loads of questions, I still do, and there are lots and lots of books written that can answer those questions. It's hard for the heart to really rest in and believe what the mind can't accept. And so that's my encouragement is to read up and try to get those questions answered if those are barriers uh, on your way to faith. That can strengthen our faith as well and give us a lot of insight. So I can give you tips on that for those of you who have contact with. If you send us uh, a, your information, we'd love to reach out to you about that. But I would also say that one of the most important things you can do in this process, since this is about a personal relationship, is to personally open your heart to God and pray and say, God, if you exist, I'm not even sure if you do, I feel kind of silly right now, but if you exist, I pray that you would reveal yourself to me. And maybe you believe that God exists, but you, f you don't feel like you know him or the know what the truth is about Jesus. Open your heart and say, God, show me the truth, and I'm willing to follow it wherever you lead. And so I hope that we've seen here in this passage that Jesus pursues us and that he awakens our longing, that he uncovers our need, and that he leads us ultimately to himself. And when we respond in faith, we get to drink from the spring of living water welling up to eternal life that begins to satisfy our thirst here and now and continues on into eternity. Let's uh, turn to him in prayer now. Lord God, we do thank you for your great love for us that you sent your only son 
so that we could be forgiven and reconciled to you and be given new and eternal life. God, I pray that all of us listening and watching would be able to experience that, that you are calling each one of us, that you're inviting us into an eternal relationship that begins now. Open our hearts to receive from you and to drink of that living water that is your Holy Spirit. We invite you to come to us by your Spirit. We invite you to fill us and to satisfy that thirst that we have in our souls with your very own presence. And it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters, join me in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Jesus draws us from the margins into a great feast. He draws us out of a crowd to healing. He draws us from death to new life. Each day, God finds the way that we need to be loved and challenged, and then calls us to minister to others in loving hospitality, healing mercies, and the promise of resurrection and new life. We respond to this marvelous call through our giving this day. Let us gather our gifts together and offer them to God in gratitude and praise. Brothers and sisters, thank you so much for your generosity. Will you join me in this offering prayer? Merciful Father, we offer with joy and thanksgiving what you have first given to us, ourselves, our time, and our possessions. They are signs of your gracious love. Receive them for the sake of him who offered himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Would you pray with me?
God Almighty, you are a God of new things. New things. You are creating a new heart in all of us. You are creating new lives, new relationships, new movement into the world based on the new heart that you've given all of us. Lord God Almighty, I want to pray for all the people, first of all, here online who are joining us this weekend in this celebration of worship, distant and yet together. Lord, give us a new vision for what the church can be, even though we are not gathered physically. We thank you that for the first 400 years of its life, the church had no building, no programs, no budget, and yet it grew faster than at any time in human history because you were doing a new thing. Lord God Almighty, do a new thing in your church. Bring your bride to new places. Do great and glorious things through your church in spite of the challenges that we face, in spite of the pandemic, in spite of the racial tensions, in spite of the political and economic nonsense that goes on in our world. Lord, make us new in our hearts, in our lives, in our marriages, in our families, in our businesses, in our communities, in our healthcare and education, in our politics, in our sports, in our arts, in our creativity, in our love, in our mission. Lord God Almighty, you are a God of new things. Give us your vision, your strength, and do a new thing in us. In Jesus' mighty and strong name, amen. Friends, would you join me in this time of confession? Heavenly Father, we long for a new beginning, but we are distracted by our daily lives. Forgive us for not seeing you as the source of those lives. Renew in us the determination to praise you and live out your great commission. Bring us forward in your grace to a new day where everyone may be fed, none turned away, and your love brings comfort to all. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Amen. Would you take a moment, wherever you are, to reflect on the things the Lord speaks into your heart? And now, friends, hear the good news. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us. And for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, your sins are forgiven. May Almighty God strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in your heart through faith. Amen. Friends, our Heavenly Father is a renewing God. When we repent and turn to Him, He brings forth sunshine in our lives. Each new day is our invitation to live by His example. So, rejoice and be glad in knowing we are forgiven and given the opportunity to be His hands and feet in this hurting world. Amen. Friends, it is our privilege to come to this table where the renewing God brings us by the power of the Spirit into the midst of the real presence of Jesus Christ. On the night when he was betrayed, Jesus took bread. He broke it. And then he said something that they'd never heard before. He said, this is my body broken for you. 
Take it and eat, all of you. Every time you eat this bread, remember me. Remember my life. Remember my teaching, my way of being in the world. Remember that I'm here to renew you. After supper, he took a cup, blessed it, gave thanks. And then he said something they'd never heard before. A new thing. This cup is my blood shed for you. Every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, remember that the creator God of the universe is reaching out to us in a new covenant that by the forgiveness of Jesus Christ, by his work on the cross, imparted to us through the means of grace given by the Holy Spirit, to the glory of God the Father, we are made new. Friends, we come to the table to participate in the real presence of Jesus Christ. He invited us to pray this way. Would you pray the prayer that he taught us? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. God is a renewing God. Hear this benediction. May the God who made the worlds brand new make you into a new person, his agent of grace in this world by the power of his spirit to the glory of the Father in the strong name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let your servant now go in peace, O Lord. Now go in peace according to your word. Now go in peace according to your word. Brothers and sisters in Christ, go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let your servant now go in peace, O Lord. Now go in peace according to your word. Now go in peace according to your word. Thank you for worshiping with us today. Our prayer is that you'll stay safe and serving and sharing your faith. And as you do so, look up to him.